This presentation is called Signs You Can't Ignore, Signs of Jesus' Return. In 1938, a special Halloween radio drama by Orson Welles aired from New York. Much of it was presented as news bulletins, suggesting to listeners that an actual invasion by alien Martians was taking place. The radio actors sounded so real that many believed that the story was true. Panic and fear gripped many across the country. Some tried to commit suicide. Some went to remote areas of the country. The Navy cancelled shore leave for the fleet in the New York Harbour. But it was all just fiction. Martians hadn't invaded, and it wasn't the end of life on Earth as we know it. The question of how the world will end has fascinated and frightened many throughout the centuries. Today there is concern that climate change will eventually destroy life on planet Earth. Some fear that we will destroy ourselves in a nuclear war. Some fear a worldwide pandemic. Others say we'll run out of food and other resources as world population continues to explode. Others are afraid we may be wiped out as a huge comet or asteroid collides with Earth. Most of us, of course, have plenty of other things to worry about. We struggle with just trying to make a living or with sickness and grief and death. For many of us, life isn't easy. Sometimes we may even find ourselves wishing the world would end. Surely life wasn't meant to be so full of pain and hunger and weariness and stress. We want a better world. The good news, my friend, is that the world is going to end and there is a better world coming. In fact, a God of love has not tried to keep information from us. Instead, he has given signs of the end and warnings about the end, so that no one needs to be surprised or caught unprepared. He desperately wants you to be a part of that world he has promised. And even when his warnings seem severe, or the way he describes end time conditions seem harsh, it's only because he loves us enough to tell us the truth. If your child was crossing the road, and about to be hit by a car, you wouldn't speak soft, comforting words. You'd shout a warning as loudly and urgently as possible because your love for the child and you want to save him or her. So just how this world will end, how will it come to an end? Tonight we're going to look at the Bible's predictions about how this will happen. And I think you'll agree with me that the prophecies given nearly 2,000 years ago are, in fact, surprisingly accurate. One day, Jesus and his disciples were in Jerusalem. The disciples were commenting on the magnificent temple, which had just been enlarged by the Roman government. Gazing at this incredible building, Jesus made a startling statement to his disciples. He said, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another. That shall not be thrown down. Matthew 24, verse 2. This was the greatest building in the Jewish nation. And Jesus predicted it would be completely destroyed. The disciples were shocked. As they followed Jesus up the Mount of Olives, they asked him the question that all of us would have asked. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Matthew 24 verse 3. You see, the disciples were sure that Jerusalem with its temple would last forever, one day ruling the nations until the end of the world. They were certain 
that the destruction Jesus foretold would take place when the whole world was destroyed. But as we study this passage more closely, we find that Jesus was actually speaking about two different events. One of them was his second coming, his return to earth in glory and the establishment of an everlasting kingdom here on planet earth. The other one, however, was the one that would be seen by many of the people alive at that time. It was the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and their beloved temple. First, let's look at what he said about the destruction of Jerusalem. He said in Matthew 24, verses 15 and 16, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, Whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Daniel had predicted that Jerusalem would be destroyed. And now Jesus reminds his disciples that the prophet Daniel's warnings would soon be fulfilled. He continued, Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes, Matthew 24, verse 17 and 18. In other words, he told them to flee for their lives because when they saw the armies encircling the city of Jerusalem, the destruction was right upon them. In Luke's account, Jesus said, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know its desolation is near. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Luke 21 verse 20 to 24. How would Jesus' words be fulfilled? In the year AD 66, approximately 33 years after Jesus gave this prediction, the Roman armies, under Cestius, the Roman governor of Syria, came to put down a rebellion that had broken out in Jerusalem. As they laid siege to the city, those in the city withstood the ravages of the Roman army. And finally the Roman armies withdrew despairing of actually being able to take the city. See Eusebius, Church History, Book 3, Chapter 5. But those who followed the instruction given by Jesus saw their opportunity and left the city, escaping the slaughter of its inhabitants when the Roman army destroyed it four years later. Over a million are believed to have been killed in the terrible siege of AD 70 if only they had obeyed Jesus' instruction to flee the city. Here is a striking lesson on the importance of studying and believing the prophecies. Those who believed Christ and watched for the signs he foretold were saved, while the unbelieving lost their lives. It will be the same at the end of time. Watchful believers will be delivered, while the careless and unbelieving will die. What about the magnificent temple? Titus, the Roman general in charge of taking the city of Jerusalem, had given orders to save the temple. But one of his soldiers threw a lighted torch through a door, and the temple was soon a raging fire. In order to save the gold that melted from the dome and ran in between the stones, the huge blocks of granite and marble had to be pried apart. Not one stone was left upon another. Jesus' predictions to his disciples 40 years earlier had been fulfilled exactly. What about the second part of Jesus' prophecy regarding the end of the world? Jesus gave a number of clear signs that would take place before the destruction of Jerusalem and before the end of the world so that his followers could know when the time was very near. 
we would do well to pay attention to his predictions. Let's take a closer look. First, Jesus said that there would be political strife and conflict. In Matthew 24, verse 7, Jesus said, For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences and earthquakes in various places. Recent decades have seen the rise of bloodshed and wars. The 20th century was the bloodiest century in mankind's history. Some 70 million perished just in the two world wars. In the most scientifically advanced and educated societies, we still have violence and hatred and bloodshed. This is one of the signs of the times. But there wouldn't only be an increase in wars near the end of time, there would also be a rise in suffering caused by natural disasters. Jesus said, there will be famines, Matthew 24, verse 7. And there are famines in many parts of the earth. As the world's population continues to explode, it is estimated that over 150,000 a day, or 7 million per year, die from starvation. And even of the billions who survive, it is estimated that 60% are malnourished. Jesus said that famines will be one of the signs of the end. The next sign that Jesus predicted was an increase in diseases. There will be famines and pestilences, Matthew 24 verse 7. The word pestilence is another word for a plague, or terrible disease. And in spite of all that modern medicine can do, AIDS, malaria, pneumonia, tuberculosis, Ebola, syphilis, gonorrhea, cholera, SARS, and now COVID-19, all of these have killed millions. The society and economic costs of lifestyle disease, which are the result of our choices in diet and health habits, are rapidly increasing. But perhaps most troubling are the diseases for which we know neither the cause nor the cure. Some of these diseases may be the result of the way we have polluted our planet. Even this environmental deterioration was predicted in God's word. Isaiah said, Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look on the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish away like smoke. The earth will grow old like a garment. Isaiah 51 verse 6. Indeed, air and water pollution take a heavy toll on the health of the planet and its inhabitants. Jesus also said that there would be increasing earthquakes as well. And there will be earthquakes in various places. Matthew 24, verse 7. It's not that there weren't earthquakes before. It's just that they've been happening more often in recent centuries. The earthquakes are also getting stronger and causing much more damage. Thousands and even tens of thousands are dying in one quake or tsunami. In the last 90 years alone, earthquakes have caused more than one and a half million deaths. Luke also records Jesus' prediction, and there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines, and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights, and great signs from heaven, and there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, Luke 21, verse 11 and 25. All across the globe, we've seen extraordinary weather, just as predicted, typhoons and hurricanes with their tidal surges, tsunamis, tornadoes and volcanoes all taking a great toll in property and lives. But the Bible gives us yet another sign 
deteriorating morality and ethics at the end of time. Jesus compared conditions on earth in the last days to Sodom and Gomorrah, two cities that were so sinful that God finally destroyed them with fire from heaven. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Luke chapter 17, verse 28 to 30. What were the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah? Jude wrote, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh. Jude chapter 1 verse 7. In other words, we can expect the world in the last days to have a low standard of morality. Greed, vice and selfishness will be very common, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 2 to 5. There will even be many scams and scammers before the end, but evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse Deceiving and being deceived, 2 Timothy 3, verse 13. Sounds a lot like today, doesn't it? In yet another sign of the last days, Christ warned about spiritual deception, false Christs and false prophets. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Matthew chapter 24, verse 23 and 24. Today the religious world is full of teachers leading away from the plain and simple teachings of the word of God. Religion in many cases has become a money-making business. And it's hard to see any difference between spirituality and entertainment. Many follow the most popular preacher or the one who promises the greatest financial success. We need to be sure that we are following the word of God. The last and greatest of all the signs we'll look at today is Jesus' prediction that the gospel will be taken to all the world. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. In the book of Revelation, God gives a description of this great announcement. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue and people. Revelation chapter 14 verse 6. Today, this final sign of the end is being fulfilled as well, even by this very message to you. This is a part of taking the everlasting gospel to every creature. The gospel is being proclaimed by television, radio, evangelistic meetings, the internet, personal Bible studies and correspondence courses around the globe. We really are living in the times that Jesus foretold. We're living in the last days, with the final great events taking place around us. Jesus compared our day to the days of Noah. The people in Noah's day were busy, making a living and going about their daily routines, with not much time for spiritual things. Jesus said, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. 
For as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until that day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Luke chapter 24 verse 37 to 39. Before the flood, the world was going about life as if it would continue the same forever. There was no urgency, no priority for spiritual things. And that's how we can expect the majority of the world to be living in the last days, just before Jesus comes. Before Jesus' first coming, there were signs that the time was near. God sent angels and wise men to let his people know about the Messiah's birth. But sad to say, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. John chapter 1 verse 11. They were not ready for his coming. They had ignored the signs. Friends, let's not be like God's people back then. Let's be ready for his second coming. He has given us all these signs which tell us that he is coming soon. Because he loves us so much, he's warned us not to be self-satisfied and half-hearted in our spiritual walk and in our moral choices. He wants to spend eternity with us. That's why he's given us all these signs that he is about to return. Jesus said, When you see all these things, know that it is near, at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Matthew chapter 24 Verse 33 and 34. Will we be ready to receive him this time? Or will he be disappointed again? The hour is late and the stakes are high. There is not a moment to lose. The steamship Central America had sailed out of New York Harbour and was heading south in the Atlantic toward the Panama Canal when she sprang a leak. Another vessel saw her distress signal and steamed up to help. The captain of the rescue ship sent over a message. What's amiss? The answer came back. We're in bad repair and going down. Lie by till morning. The would-be rescuer could see the steamship listing in the water and replied, Let me take your passengers on board now. But night had fallen, and the captain of Central America didn't want to risk transferring passengers in the dark. He repeated, Lie by till morning. The other captain sent another message, insisting that action should be taken now. But he was refused. He had to wait some distance off in the gathering night. His staff on the bridge could make out the lights of the Central America bobbing in the waves. About an hour and a half later, they watched, aghast, as those lights disappeared. The ship had gone down, and all on board died. To wait may end up in being lost forever. There are times when you have to make a decision now. The captain of the Central America thought it wasn't a problem to wait until morning. He was sadly mistaken. The Bible says, Today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Don't delay. Why not make your decision for Christ right now? Won't you lift up your heart to God right now and ask him to help you prepare for Christ's soon coming? I want to say to Jesus, thank you. Thank you for providing a saviour for my certain death. I just want to let you save me, Jesus. Is that your desire? Would you like to join me in that prayer?
Let's pray together now. Dear Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us these signs in your word to tell us when the end is near. Thank you for the promise that you are coming again and will save all those who trust and obey you. We come to you now because we don't want to put it off until the morning. We want to give you right now permission to save us from our sins. Help us, along with our loved ones, to be ready to meet you. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.